OK, so yeah, we're going to give just a quick overview of where we currently are at in the project timeline. So as we discussed during our last meeting, all of the interviews have been completed and all the transcripts have gone through a first round of coding. We are currently in the process of analyzing the qualitative data and we have preliminary fi preliminary findings that we'll be sharing with you today, which is very exciting. Um, we hope to have the qualitative findings finalized within the next couple of weeks, at which point we'll integrate them with the quantitative results. So as for our project deliverables, the writing of the implementation guide is underway and we have started creating the outline for the first academic manuscript. We would really appreciate your feedback on the implementation guide when it's drafted, so please stay tuned for that later in the spring. For the workshops, we've created an agenda for the agency focused workshop, which we will hopefully discuss during this meeting if we have time. Um, yeah, as Madison said, if not, we'll just email you guys after. So as for workshop number three, which is the youth and family focused workshop, um, following internal discussions with the members of the engagement team at the Knowledge Institute, and also considering all of the helpful feedback that you guys provided during our last team meeting, we have agreed that having a youth and family focused workshop on the research findings may not be the most engaging or interesting for youth and families. So instead, we're going to explore other ways to mobilize this knowledge to different audiences, including young people and family members in collaboration with members of our engagement team here at the Knowledge Institute. For the youth and family members that would like to learn more about the research study findings, they, of course, would be more than welcome to join our agency focused workshop. And finally, we're, we're still waiting to hear back from the Canadian Collaborative Mental Health Care in Canada conference about our submitted abstract. And once we hear back, we will be sure to let you guys know. So I'm going to pass it on over to Madison to talk about the qualitative findings. Yeah, we were talking about an analogy at our last Critical Friends meeting, and I liked it so much because my brain works in analogies. So basically, here's where we're at with uh, qualitative analysis. We finished the first round of coding, and it felt like turning on the lights in a dark room, and we were finally able to see all of our data. We are able to look around the room and see all of the interviews that we conducted. But it also felt a bit overwhelming, kind of like we we're in a disorganized storage room and Rula and I were given the task of cleaning it and sorting it up. So right now though, it feels like we've established a filing system and we're testing it out to see if it works and we're starting to organize the storage room. And what we're going to share today is one part of the analysis. So like one corner of the room, if you will, because we're just talking about barriers and facilitators to implementing the engagement standards. We'll have other qualitative findings to present later on about principles-based standards, uh, perceptions of engagement, some of those other uh, research objectives that we've been talking about over the course of the year. Um, but today it's just barriers and facilitators because that's what we were able to get to. And I really wanna stress that these are preliminary findings. So we're kind of hoping to treat this like a critical friends meeting in the sense that uh, we'll share with you some of the findings and we'll be asking like, does this make sense? Is our wording clear? So as we move through the slides, feel free to put questions in the chat uh, or raise your hand to ask questions because uh, Rula and I will try not to talk too, too much um, and just be getting feedback mostly. Uh, but the way that we've decided to structure our qualitative results for now is to express some of their ideas, our participants' ideas, as belief statements. So we saw that this was used in the literature base for the theoretical domains framework, and we were drawn to this type of statement because we felt like it was a really accessible and intuitive way of summarizing our participants' beliefs about factors that help and hinder implementation. So on every side, you'll see the belief statement, uh, whether participants see this as a barrier, a facilitator, or both, depending on their individual context, and the codes from our codebook that is captured by each belief statement. Uh, so starting with goals, there were several belief statements that we came up with. Uh, for the most part, everyone expressed that their organization or that they themselves intended to implement or continue implementing the standards. Uh, most felt that it was a priority for their organization, but then in the third row, you can see that some participants expressed the belief that it's a priority for some people, but they're not sure if it's a priority for everyone. That was a smaller segment of our sample. 
Uh, they also expressed a belief that EDI work and accreditation mirror the principles that are in the engagement standards. People kept pointing out that alignment. Uh, and again, these are our participants' beliefs, not necessarily our beliefs. And implementing the engagement standards competes for time with their everyday work. Uh, and also some folks said that implementing the engagement standards aligns with their strategic plan. Uh, engagement is often worked into the strategic plans of different organizations. So I'll pause here to ask if this makes sense, if our wording is clear, if anyone has any questions about these belief statements. Louise. I just have a question for the first one, and I know we talked about this in a previous meeting and how to differentiate if if an organization is doing, say, just the youth engagement standard or just the family engagement standard versus both. So what would that look like for the, the first one? Some organizations are implementing both. Uh, some are just implementing youth. Some are just implementing family. And I think one thing that we're hoping to do is maybe some sort of table with the belief statements. That's something we often see in academic journals. But then in the body text of the results, start to express some of these nuances. So that's a great example of something that we would maybe want to highlight in the text is which standard are folks actually implementing or intending to implement. OK, that, that'd be great because I'm definitely curious as to whether or not that people have an easier time with one or the other, or, or, and I know that that kind of data is being gathered as well. Um, so that'll be really interesting. Thanks. I'll move on to beliefs about consequences. Uh, so it was almost universally expressed that there are no negative consequences to implementing the engagement standards. Uh, some folks added the caveat of if they are implemented correctly, and they meant that their principles are not supposed to be treated as a checkbox, or you are trying to co-develop and partner with youth and families if you're just using them in a tokenistic way. Obviously, that doesn't align with the engagement standards. You're not implementing them correctly. Um, so that's the wording we've gone with for now. Uh, I know it's not. Perfect. Uh, there was also the belief that implementing the engagement standards will lead to positive outcomes for children, youth, and families, and positive outcomes for staff, organizations, and the system. And again, in those paragraph, like the text form of the results, we would probably spell out what specifically those positive outcomes are because we heard varied responses from people. And see people are reading and digesting. So I'll continue pausing for questions. Louise? I'm just thinking about the some of the language in particular just about the first one about the negative consequences um and the the kind of the if dynamic and i'm wondering about the language that's in oh i, I totally forget the it's the when thens you know when you've got little kids um uh, that when when implementing the engagement standards correctly there are no negative then there are no negative consequences and just wondering whether or not if that kind of language either simplifies it or kind of takes away any potential in, um, uh, perception that the uh, if they're implemented correctly is like a, 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 a caveat as opposed to actually part of what the whole statement's about. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like that wording. And definitely yeah. take that back. I think that's the one statement that I've been sort of rereading again and again. I'm wondering if we can use more strengths based language um, to reword that, like Louise mentioned. Um, I will be honest, I can't come up 
with it right off the top of my head right now. So um, what I'm hoping to do is think about that statement and maybe potentially provide some edits to language as well, just to make sure that we're that we're sort of centering that statement around the idea that the client or the agency, whoever is using the standards, is the actor or the agent of change in the situation. Um, but just to flag that for you, Madison, I'll get back to you with more thoughtful feedback. Thank you. That'd be great. Yeah, the slides will be distributed by email. And what was the other thing I wanted to say? Oh, yeah. In terms of this being a preliminary sort of analysis, we're also hoping to collapse some statements and like refine it even further. We're already seeing overlap in some of them. Um, so yeah, that'll come in the future too. Uh, so moving on to emotions. The vast majority of people feel passionate, driven, and excited about implementing the engagement standards, and they reported that this helped do this work. Uh, some folks felt passionate, but also stressed, frustrated, and overwhelmed, and yet overall, the emotions helped drive their efforts, even the overwhelmed um, or feeling frustrated. It just motivated them to uh, continue striving. And then uh, a small part of our sample felt passionate, but also the nervous and the overwhelmed led them to feel like the task was too big, and that actually was a barrier. Um, I'll just say there's something in the chat, Madison, about uh, potential rewording, which um, I can take note of, but just to acknowledge that, thank you. And thank you for adding, Shreya. That's helpful to know that it's a, a shared thought. In terms of, yeah, the emotions piece, is everything making sense on this slide? Yeah. I guess, Christina, I saw that you popped on, so maybe I should explain. Uh, we've decided to structure our analysis, at least initially, in terms of belief statements. Uh, so these are things that our participants believe. That was uh, coming through in the data, so not necessarily our beliefs, but the beliefs of our participants. Yeah, and I'll just add, Madison, you mentioned this, but like you said, Christina just popped on. So we're looking at just one part right now of the analysis, which is focusing on barriers and facilitators to implementing the standards. There's other pieces that we'll be adding on um, from the data, but right now we're just focusing on that based on the uh, theoretical domains framework. Sounds great. Thank you. And so the majority of folks that we spoke to feel capable implementing the engagement standards, uh, sometimes because of previous experience, but another idea was because of training and support. So maybe they received engagement training, maybe they received support from an implementation coach at the Knowledge Institute. And then there's a very small number of our interview participants who feel a slight lack of confidence at the thought of implementing the engagement standards. Uh, I'm particularly curious about the wording in the last one and whether like a slight lack of confidence at the thought of implementing the engagement standards, um, whether that wording is, I guess, well worded and. I think this one's hard because, oh, I didn't put up my hand. Sorry, um, Madison, I think this one's hard because all of the people that you would have received information from are people who um, would have background information. So it's not those coming without, without that. So yeah, I hear you on a slight lack of confidence, but I, th I think that's really important to capture as well, even though, yeah, that's a tough one. And I guess we wanted to focus on the the domain on the theoretical domains framework is your belief about your capability. It's not about whether or not they actually are capable. Um, 
So that's why we stuck with the word confidence because it's more about that internal self-evaluation. Yeah, for me, it's the word slight. So how do you, you know, how do you measure? You either, just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if there's a better way of capturing the idea because it wasn't that people were saying out and out, I don't feel confident. Um, they were just expressing some some doubts. So maybe we can take that back and think about a better way of making it clear that it's not a total lack of confidence. It's just in some areas, maybe they're a little bit less confident. And what's a better way of saying that? Uh, so under the optimism domain, there were two main beliefs that were being expressed. Uh, one was that implementing the standards is realistic if your agency is committed, has a plan, and dedicates resources to this task. Uh, another group of people also believed that it was realistic, but they were more so highlighting the challenges uh, and the amount of time and effort that it required. We felt that was significant enough to group into two different belief statements for now. Um, so yeah, any thoughts about the belief statements on this slide? I'll just acknowledge again that there's something in the chat about our last one, and I'll just I'll note that down. So thank you, Louise. Thanks for taking notes, Rula. Yeah, Louise. Like I said, I always have questions. <laughs> what do we fair? Um, I'm trying to remember, are these the only two belief statements that relate to optimism? Yeah. Okay, because uh, both of them on the belief statement side and the code side use the word realistic. And I'm wondering, most of the time when I hear people saying something in reference to realists, being realistic it's usually about the managing expectations more so than optimism um uh like you know let's be realistic or if we're being realistic this is all we can do it often is tied to like being realistic so that you can retain optimism but i don't think the overall feeling comes from a place of optimism mm -hmm. but more you know practicality or pragmatics um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that might might affect things, uh, how people read into it. Um, mm -hmm. And wondering if maybe like doable is the word that keeps coming to mind that to me feels more in the optimism vein. It's like, oh yeah, this is doable. This is great. Um, just not sure. Just thought I would I would mention that. Okay. So I think the thing that we would change then is in the belief statement, implementing and sustaining the engagement standards is doable. Um, the codes are just included for you folks so that you can see the transition between the code book and the belief statement. This wouldn't be something that we'd include in any sort of final write-up. Uh, potential readers don't necessarily need to see our codes. Um, can I just add in something with the word realistic? Um, I definitely see what's being said about the negative connotation, um, but it was also the word that we used when we asked participants the question, like this was part of our interview guide. So it is kind of reflective of what was actually being asked and like the data in a way. So maybe something to keep in mind for us to like balance, making sure that we're actually including what we asked and what was said, but also making sure that connotation is, is coming through. So. Great point. It's just it's, it's something to consider. I think that word, the use of the word realistic would be um, rather dependent on the role that you have within your organization. So for me as an administrator, when I look at realistic, I'm looking at a plan, training, resource, capacity, all of all of those things. Right, a family, a specific family needs engagement clinician who, who's actually charged with doing the work. Would, would, you know, might 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 interpret that word quite differently. So I, I think it's an okay word, 
Um, but I think it's open to, um, it's influenced by the role that you have. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Well, and one of the things that we want to make sure we're doing is also that we're linking it back to the theoretical domains framework. So if the domain is optimism, we're trying to figure out whether essentially participants have very pessimistic beliefs about whether or not this thing that they're trying to implement can even be implemented or whether they're more optimistic, which would obviously be a facilitator. Um, so yeah, just trying to find the right word that gets across the idea that essentially they're feeling optimistic about this, so it's a facilitator. So whether that word is realistic or possible or doable or what, we'll have to think about. Um, but that's the overall idea that we're trying to get across and how it links back to the TDF. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'll pass it over to Rula to talk about some of the next ones. Sure. So our next domain is professional role and some of the things that we heard or some of the belief statements that uh, we've kind of extracted from that data is that not all staff at my organization view engagement as a shared responsibility across the organization. So, you know, the idea that some people may feel like engagement isn't really part of their job while others feel it's more uh, within that bucket. Um, we also heard that having a seat at the decision making table and when we have quotes, um, it's usually exact wording that was used by our participants. Um, so having a seat at the decision making table allows me to contribute to organizational policies and activities. Uh, and this was expressed as a facilitator to implementing the standards. Um, we also heard that having engagement as a key component in uh, the job title or description, you know, acts as a facilitator by providing legitimacy and enabling um, participants to take part in day-to-day -day engagement activities. And um, you know, a barrier that was expressed is having to work, again, quote unquote, off the side of my desk um, on engagement, on implementing the standards, rather than it being a designated responsibility. Um, so, so those are some of the most common things that we heard. Um, I'll pause if anyone has any points about our wording or any questions, anything's unclear. Okay, I think we'll move on just because I'm cognizant of time and then if anything comes up in the chat or through email is, you know, feedback is always welcome. Um, so next domain is knowledge. So I felt like there were, or we felt like there were two kind of main buckets here. So when people were talking about knowledge of other staff at their organization, and then when they were kind of expressing their own personal knowledge, either directly or indirectly, um, about the standards. So in terms of other staff, you know, we heard that non-engagement staff at organizations don't really know the value of the engagement standards and don't understand why they're important. Um, and we also heard that non-engagement staff don't really have a clear understanding of the content of the engagement standards, you know, and the language that's used. So kind of one, um, you know, theme here is the perception or the understanding of how important the standards are. And then we also heard, um, you know, there might be a lack of a clear understanding of the actual standards. So what do the standards say? You know, the language that's used. Um, so a little bit of more like a practical understanding of the standards. Um, and in terms of the personal knowledge of our participants that we were chatting with, we heard that, you know, some of them have a clear understanding of the standards and what it means to implement them. Um, and some of them expressed, you know, not really knowing the content or, you know, what the standards say off the top of their head, which could ten potentially could be, um, you know, a barrier to implementation. Any questions or comments about that one? This one, I'll, I'll admit, was a little bit hard to sift through for me in terms of what we heard, just because it it feels like we're kind of extracting things and maybe, um, you know, they don't know the content off the top of their head. Is this really a barrier? Does this kind of, it's it, there's a little bit of, you know, back and forth and maybe we'll refine that a little bit more for the next time we present this. But um, yeah, any feedback on that? People don't know what they don't know exactly. Yeah, this one was definitely a tricky one. Okay, we'll move on to skills. Sorry, we're kind of going through a little bit fast. I, I want to give people a chance to like digest what we're talking about, but also try to get through some things. So 
Um, so for skills, uh, we heard, you know, also kind of two buckets here. So what are the actual skills that people think are important uh, for implementing the standards? And then what do they or what's their perception, you know, of the level of skills uh, that they have or that their organization has? So how skilled do they think that they are or their organization is um, at implementing the standards? So in terms of the perceived or the perception of skills, uh, we did commonly hear that either the participant themselves or that their organization has the necessary skills to effectively implement the standards. Um, and we also did hear from some participants, although um, a, a less, you know, a smaller number, that their organization skill level is on a spectrum. So, you know, there are individual skills uh, that may vary within the organization. Some people may be more skilled, some people may be less skilled. Um, and this could be a barrier, but not necessarily. That's why there's a little question mark there. So, <laughs> um, and then in terms of the specific skills um, that we heard that are important. So this kind of uh, ties into the specific codes that we had, you know, chatted with with um, our team about, but sincerely recognizing young people and families as experts, valuing their input and empowering them to use their voice is an important skill, uh, conveying and receiving information effectively, you know, including clearly expressing ideas and actively listening, also as a facil facilitator that was commonly mentioned. Um, arranging engagement opportunities in a coordinated, inviting, and organized way for young people and families and staff um, was also important. Um, facilitating interactions or an environment that young people and families feel is safe, judgment-free, and relatable um, was also a commonly mentioned facilitator. And being able to adapt to changing ideas or demands and identify solutions to overcome barriers was also mentioned um, as an important skill. So this one, there's also a lot here. So yes, Shreya, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot. I'll likely have more feedback when I like look at the nitty gritty language. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing I wanted to flag is the one, two, three, four, five, sixth belief statement that facilitating interactions in an environment that young people and families feel is safe. Um, I want to reconsider using the word safe in there only because we can't always guarantee safe spaces for all young people and family members. So I understand what you're trying to get at around like making sure that safety is prioritized in facilitating interactions. I think maybe we can reword it or even include an environment that young people and families feel comfortable. Um, that could be a word used, but I don't know whether we should use the word safe. I think we're always aspiring to have safer spaces, but we can't guarantee safety for all. That's a really good point. And I'm noting that down potentially as a wording change. <clears throat> I like the idea of like comfortable. Um, yeah, safe is the goal, but like you said, it's, it can't be guaranteed. So, yeah. Okay, we can move on to reinforcement. Um, so a common idea that we heard is being accountable for implementing the engagement standards fosters a sense of obligation to implement them. Um, and this in turn, you know, facilitates the implementation. Uh, we also heard that specific incentives, you know, people gave examples of training workshops, you know, grants uh, can increase the uptake of the engagement standards at an organization. So I'll pause here and I'll also go to the chat because I see something considering factors that affect people's sense of safety. Okay, thank you, Louise. I think too, just knowing that some people, including people on this team have meetings after this, uh, it might be best I'll skip ahead to the next steps, especially because everyone will get these slides afterwards. If you want to provide more detailed feedback, uh, you're more than welcome. And also keep in mind, we are still working and refining the analysis. We're thinking about the qualitative data a lot over the coming weeks. So don't feel as though um, you need to provide like very detailed feedback because you might provide feedback inadvertently on something that changes or gets cut or anything like that. Um, so we'll have more finalized results to share uh, later on in the spring. Um, also, yeah, we included the workshop agenda for the agency focused workshop in our pre meeting email. So if you have any feedback on that sometime in the next week, if you could get that to us. Um, because, yeah, that's really like a, a comprehensive overview of what we're hoping to present. So it would be awesome to get everyone's thoughts on that. And we'll be having our very last team meeting on April 9th. 
so I'll open it up to my team in case there's anything else, but I, I think I hit everything in terms of next steps. I think so, Madison, thank you. Yeah, Before that all sounds great. Oh, I was just going to say for the workshop, if anyone wants to chat one on one, please just reach out to me because I know there's been some questions, so um, I'm happy to jump on a call. And just checking, are there any questions just before we we sign off? Uh, I'm sorry that it was a bit rushed today. We'll, we'll likely be bringing some of this back at our next meeting in terms of the coding and the results. Shreya. Yeah, um, Madison and Verlo, when do you expect, anticipate to send out the slides and all the information that you shared today? It's whenever we get the link back for the recording. Um, okay, so perfect. Typically within a week, that's what we hope for, um, but sometimes there are delays. Okay, no worries. Thank you. And I see Louise. Oh, oh, sorry. Go, go well, ahead. Are we going to stay on just for a few minutes to touch on the workshop? Yeah, so you and I can stay on or I can just give you a call right afterwards. So we're still okay. good for that. And I just just Louise had typed something in the chat, an idea for workshop three. What does it all mean? Louise, did you have uh, did you have an idea you wanted to share? Yeah, just kind of oh, now of course the dog's gonna bark. Um just the you know, if if it's one that's kind of for broader audiences and not just a uh, youth or, or family focused as the audience. Sorry. Um, just thinking about, you know, what do the findings mean? Um, you know, what are kind of the the learnings from it or, or maybe an opportunity to also like kind of validate, does this make sense? This is what the interpretation has been. This is what our findings are. What does this mean to you? Um, that might be something that might be interesting in terms of, uh, you know, adding more to the, uh, um, you know, the knowledge mobilization and understanding there. That, that that's really great. I've taken some notes because we're starting to sort of plan for uh, some of the facilitated breakout sessions at at the workshop that we're uh, organizing. So I think uh, think those are some great suggestions, and um, maybe that's something that we can uh, we can share um, in advance of the next meeting or during the next meeting. I know that we're sharing the sort of annotated agenda and sort of the plan, but we would really welcome your input uh, on some of the discussion questions. Um, you know, if there's interest in, in doing some co-presenting during the workshop, um, similar to what we did with the first workshop, but we're really, uh, really open to that. So um, have a look at the materials. If, if, if it's easier to sort of chat through them, just let us know and we can set up a quick, uh, quick meeting to chat. But um, but yeah. A a any other comments or questions before we sign off? I know we've gone over, and I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, wanting to respect everybody's time, but at the same time, wanting to make sure everyone's leaving today with their questions answered. Oops, I'll put my hand up. <laughs> Go for it, Louise. I didn't have a question, but a comment when I was reading mm -hmm. the uh, the email that uh, Cassia that you had sent out with all the materials and and my brain completely registered finally last meeting. I'm like, wow, this project that seemed to be so huge and so big. Uh, wow, we're, we're really far into it. And uh, I just want to comment that and all the hard work that's gone to, to get us here. This is wonderful. Yeah, no, thanks, Louise. We we had actually this was originally the last meeting, and then we added an, another meeting because we wanted to make sure we had enough time uh, to to get through, you know, the discussions of all the findings. And I, you know, there still will be engagement with the team because some of the pieces will be, um, you know, coming much later. Like we've shared, you know, we have an abstract submitted. There's a couple of manuscripts that uh, we want to prepare to to share the findings, but we've also been having some ongoing discussions with Kelly and, and how we can support her team in, in using some of this evidence from this grant. So I think 
you know, if there's a need for us to have another meeting, we absolutely, you know, would happy to organize something, but we're also trying to be mindful of people's time and, and the commitments they've made to the project. Uh, but I do agree, it, it has complete the time. It just has gone by so quickly and, and you know, kudos to everyone on, on how far we've come with this work. And it, it's exciting. We're at the point now where some of the results are being able to um, you know, be shared and, and discussed and, and interpreted. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, I noticed that a few people, we've lost a few people because of other meetings, but, uh, um, yeah, I, that, that was really it. Um, as always, you can reach out to any of us, you know, in between meetings and, uh, you know, for those with, with kiddos at home for March break, I hope you enjoy the March break. Uh, I know mine is is waiting for mom to sign off on the computer so we can uh, spend some time together. But uh, appreciate everybody coming together, sharing your thoughts and, and comments uh, to help with this project. So thanks. Thanks so much, thanks, everybody. Everyone. Enjoy Bye. the rest of your week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.